Please be opening your Bibles to the Old Testament, Second Samuel, Second Samuel chapter twelve. Second Samuel chapter twelve, verses one through fourteen. Second Samuel twelve, one through fourteen. We will read this and it will serve as the basic text for our sermon this morning. And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him, and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished up. And it grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat, and drank of his own cup, and lay in his bosom, and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock, and of his own herd, to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb, and dressed it for the man that was come to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel. And I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. And I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom. And gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given to thee such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. And hast taken the, his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes. And give them unto thy neighbor. And he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of the sun. For thou didst it secretly. And I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. And David said unto Nathan. I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David. The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. Howbeit, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. I want you to hold those thoughts in mind, and they're not new to most of you, if not all of you, as we go into a study for a little while of conviction. Conviction. The word itself carries three meanings. The effort of convincing someone of something. Being convinced of something. And a strong belief that affects how we live. We think of conviction as it usually applies to the legal system in a court case and evidence produced and the person is tried who's accused of the crime and thus convicted when the decision is you're guilty on the basis of the law and the adequate evidence and credible witnesses. Thus, those who have gone to prison have been convicted and they're known as convicts. But I think you also see in view of this account of David and the sin he committed and how God convicted him of sin 
and how he received with meekness the engrafted word of God and convicted himself of sin. That this is an important matter when it comes to the preaching of the gospel, when it comes to restoring brethren who have fallen away from the faith or who have been overtaken in a certain trespass and overcome. When Nathan came to him, David had no knowledge of what Nathan was going to do. Notice that Nathan, being a prophet, has been sent to him specifically, watch it, to convict David of sin. And without Nathan, without Nathan, David would have continued to hide his sin. That's what he had been doing. He would have become used to the guilt of sin. He would have convinced himself that he was just like everybody else in one way or the other. And he would have been thinking, well, that's normal because that's the way we psychologically can do when time passes by and we're justifying ourselves in committing sin and transgressing God's law. Nathan's role, and this is a point that needs to be understood, Nathan's role is just as critical as David's repentance. We most of the time go to this and show how he was convicted and how wonderful it is that he had an honest and good heart and he would receive the evidence and fess up, repent, and confess his sins. But here we're able to see in a portion of that Bible that was written a four time for our learning, Romans 15, 4, that Nathan's place in this was so important. And thus, for each one of us who have been lightened by the gospel, who have obeyed the gospel, who have set our course on heaven, if we would reach other people, they must be convicted of their sins, and we play a part in it. That's why we must be clear and forthright and frank and candid as we set out the way of life in the Bible, as we expose things contrary to the doctrine of Christ, and as we uphold the way of life in the gospel of Christ, which is God's power to save us, Romans 1.16. So this is the task of every prophet you read of in the Old Testament, and every faithful preacher of the gospel of Christ, and yes, also the shepherds of the flock of God today. You'll remember that when Jesus was telling the apostles about what would happen when he would no longer be with them, how the Holy Spirit would come and work with them invisibly, that the Holy Spirit would reveal the whole truth to them and cause them to remember everything the Lord had taught them and that they would then convict the world of sin, John 16 and verse 8. And when you look in Titus chapter 1 verse 9 at Paul's writing, he talks about how that a bishop, an elder, a presbyter must be able to exhort and the very words used, convict the gainsayers. This is a part of their work. This is a part of their being faithful to God as elders. This also is what Peter did as you read Luke's account of it in Acts chapter 2 when the Lord's church was established. He preached the gospel along with the other apostles and he caused them to see that they had put to death the Son of God. And so when you read Acts 2 and verses specifically 36 and 37, they were pricked in their heart. That's conviction. They acknowledged that they were sinners the very one that they looked for and longed for when he came, they didn't recognize him. And Peter said, you have taken them wicked, and with it, wicked hands have crucified and slain the Son of God. And they were pricked in their heart. Their conscience got hold of them. This is what Paul did when the scripture relates how he worked among the Ephesians for three years. Acts chapter 20, 25 through 31. Listen to me. Knowledge of the Bible doesn't do you or anybody else any good unless it causes you to be convicted of your sins. 
When you teach the Bible, you're not just teaching a history book, a science book, a geography book. You are teaching it with the intent to convict people of their sins. If we could just get it in our heads that the greatest enemy we have, or really it's the only one we should be deeply concerned about, is sin. There's nothing else to separate you from God but sin. And if you cannot be convicted of sin, you cannot be saved from sin. And yet it's the church, those who have been convicted of their sins, those who have humbled themselves and turned to God and on His own terms in the gospel, who have gained remission of sins in believing in Christ, repenting of those sins, confessing their faith in Christ as the Son of God, and being baptized for the remission of sins. Now, how can you be baptized for the remission of sins if you're not convicted of sin and know that sin's in your life and it needs to be gotten rid of and the guilt of it wiped away, washed away? God in His mind forgiving you your sins and remembering them against you no more. So it's rather ridiculous to be baptized for the remission of sins when you haven't been convicted of sin. So it's the preaching of the rightly divided Word of God that causes people to come to grips with the fact that they've sinned and they're lost. And if they died at this very moment, they would but lift up their eyes and torment. People have to reach that stage before conversion can take place. Unless people are convinced that they are in sin, there is literally no true biblical motivation for them to change. Any doctrine that would try to motivate people to become a Christian, any doctrine that would make people think they can convert somebody to Christ and ignore this point, is a false doctrine. Whatever approach you take to people to reach them with the gospel, it must be an approach that causes them to be convicted of their sins and that they know what the Lord requires in the gospel for them to gain remission or forgiveness of sins. If a person is not convinced he's a sinner, then is he ever going to say, men, brethren, what shall we do? Why change something that's not broken? <laughs> that's what humanism is saying to all of us. You're the measure of all things. Whatever man is, it'll be man that gets him there. What is sin? Nothing. So you're not going to repent. There's nothing to repent of. So men must be caused to understand that sin, the transgression of God's law, 1 John 3, 4, is the only thing that can cause you to lose your soul, and that Christ came to remedy the sin problem. So to preach Christ is to preach the remedy of sin, thus you must get people to realize all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23, and that the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. This idea of trying to sneak up on people, the idea to get them converted without even conviction, is certainly a message of the devil. It won't happen. Men must be in their own minds convicted of their sins just like David was. And it takes us who are the teachers of truth as Nathan did to get them to see thou art the man. Unless a person realizes they don't know it all, a lot of people are never going to get the first base because they're pretty well determined they know it all. Then they're not going to be ready to learn. How can you get somebody to learn when you think there's nothing else for them to learn? It doesn't make a lot of sense. You can look throughout, and I mentioned this this morning even in, in our Bible class, but you can look throughout the gospel accounts and see how often Jesus Christ, who came to seek and save that which was lost, first shows the questioner just how much he did not know, or how wrong he actually was before he answers the question put to him. Look with me to Luke chapter 11. Luke 11, 
as proof of this very point, one instance where you can find this. Luke 11 and, and look at verse 37. We'll begin with verse 37. Luke 11, verse 37, And as he spake, that's Jesus, a certain Pharisee besought him to dine with him. And he went in and sat down to meet. And when the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. And the Lord said unto him, Now do you Pharisees make clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but your inward part is full of ravening and wickedness? Ye fools, did not he that made that which is without make that which is within also? But rather give alms of such things as you have. And behold, all things are clean unto you. But woe unto you, Pharisees, for ye tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs and pass over judgment and the love of God. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. Woe unto you, Pharisees, for ye love the uppermost seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are as graves which appear not, and the men that walk over them are not aware of them. Then answered one of the lawyers and said unto him, Master, thus saying, thou reproachest us also. And he said, Woe unto you also, ye lawyers, for ye laid men with burdens grievous to be borne, and ye yourselves touch not the burdens with one of your fingers. Woe unto you, for ye build the sepulchres of the prophets, and your fathers kill them. Truly ye bear witness that ye allow the deeds of your fathers, for they indeed kill them, and ye build their sepulchres. Therefore also said the wisdom of God, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they shall slay and persecute, that the blood of all the prophets, which was shed from the foundation of the world, may be required of this generation. From the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, which perished between the altar and the temple, verily I say unto you, it shall be required of this generation. Woe unto you, lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. Ye entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering in ye hindered. Reproof is a blessing to the sinner. Now, I dare say those people who listened to Jesus and he directed by name his comments to them, I doubt they recognized that it was that big a blessing to them. But it was. A person's in danger, you tell him he's in danger. When a person's condemned and he's in ignorance of it, you tell him he's condemned. And you show him what he needs to know, and you're specific about it. In Psalm 14, or rather 141, I want you to notice what we find in verse 5 regarding how that reproof is a blessing. Let the righteous smite me, it shall be a kindness. And let him reprove me, it shall be an excellent oil, which shall not break my head, for yet my prayer also shall be in their calamities. Beloved, anything that rescues the lost is a benefit, even if it's extremely painful at the time. Who wants to be lost? As the Bible defines that term, who wants to be lost in a devil's hell from which there's no escape? It's just that way once you get there. And it never, never 
never ends. Wouldn't you think then that you would want somebody to warn us and to speak as Jesus, the master teacher, whose whole reason for coming was to save men from their sins, to speak as he did speak? But again, reproof is not often appreciated. Consider what's said by the Proverbs writer in Proverbs 9, verses 7 and 8. He that reproveth a scorner getteth to himself shame. And he that rebuketh a wicked man getteth himself a blot. Reprove not a scorner lest he hate thee, rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. Now what do you think about David? Thou art the man. And immediately he says, I have sinned. Now that was a potent thing that Nathan did. David could have had him killed. Other kings did when the prophets pointed out specifically their sins. So much is said about David. And while it's great that he repented, don't forget the man that produced the truth that pinpointed the problem that caused David to say, I have sinned. In the long run, those who genuinely listen to the message will appreciate the effort. And the writer of Proverbs has something to say about that too. Proverbs 28 in verse 23, the scripture reads, He that rebuketh the man afterwards shall find more favor than he that flattereth with the tongue. A lot of my preaching brethren need to learn that. They have learned to preach in such a way as that you don't know who they're talking about, but you do get the idea they're against sin, but he's really having a hard time to find one. And that's no good. And that's not wisdom. For whatever way you approach people regarding sin, they must feel the force, if they're guilty, of the guilt of sin. They can't convert unless they do. It's so essential, so very essential, that we reprove the lost. Look at Ezekiel 3, verses 17 through 21. Ezekiel 3, 17 through 21. Look at the charge God lays upon this man. Son of man, I have made thee a watchman in the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way, to save his life. The same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Now what if Nathan hadn't done what God sent him there to do? David would have died for his sins, but what would happen to Nathan? He would have died for not doing what God told him to, which involved causing David to be convicted of his sins. Now watch. Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity. Listen. But thou hast delivered thy soul. Notice further here. Again, when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness, and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. Because thou hast not given him warning, he shall die in his sin, and his righteousness which he hath done shall not be remembered, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man that the righteous sin not, and he doth not sin, he shall surely live, because he is warned. Also, thou hast delivered thy soul. As a preacher for all these years, it grieves me greatly that preachers don't see the truth in this. And that the church will not require a preacher to preach with this conviction himself that this is his duty. What is the reason for having a preacher? 
if he can't constantly make sin the enormous and terrible monster that it is. It's the only thing that can separate you from God. And when you die in that situation, you're always forever in a devil's, devil's hell separated from God. Consider that we must be convinced of our own sins. Each one of us must be convinced of his own sins. Now you think back, those of you that are Christians, you think back to the time when the gospel got right into your inward man and said, Thou art the man. Thou art the woman. You and you alone sin, and you chose to sin. Nobody did it to you. You chose it, and more than likely, you enjoyed it. Now you've got to come to grips with the fact, all right, I've done it, and I'm separated from God by it. And if I die in this state, there is no hope for me. And now the message comes, the way of salvation. But only those who know they have need of it are going to respond to it properly. Jesus said that the whole don't need a physician. It's the sick that need a physician. Now, that's not such a profound thing. But yet, look what really it is. That people can get the wrong idea. The Savior should go to the saved. No, the Savior goes to the lost. The preacher should preach to the saved. Yes, about what? It has to do with how to be faithful as a Christian so you won't get caught back up into sin. Sin is the only thing that will destroy you. Nothing else can keep you from God. You might be poor. You might be handicapped. You might be in some way, whatever, of this world, but if it does not transgress God's law, then it can't hurt you eternally. And the gospel is designed to expose sin, to make it for what it is, and to convince people that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If we fail in this, then we in a sense self-destruct. I say again, David could have raged against Nathan. David could have killed Nathan. But in doing so, he would kill himself. Instead, he said, I say again, I have sinned against the Lord. 2 Samuel 12 and verse 13. Consider some examples for a little bit of conviction. No, uh, Jonah was sent to the great Assyrian city of Nineveh and told within a certain time, God's going to destroy you unless you repent. And they listened and came to grips with the fact we are sinners, it's our fault, and they repented, Matthew 12, 41. Jesus used as an example to the people of his day who had greater opportunity than the people of Nineveh did, yet Nineveh repented, but Jesus is here now teaching them firsthand, face to face, and they won't receive the message. Again, I remind you of Acts 2, 37, that in the preaching of the gospel, the Jews on that day were pricked in their hearts, at Peter's teaching and cried out unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Folks, they would have never done that before they heard that sermon, which sermon proved to them Jesus of Nazareth is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, and that they were sinners, and they recognized it. Then there's Saul's reaction to the Lord. He thought he had God in the doing of everything he did in persecuting the church. And yet, when the Lord appears to him as he goes to Damascus to arrest others, who are Christians, he's trembling. And he says, Who art thou, Lord? I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Well, what do you have me to do? Go unto the city of Damascus, the street called Straight, and there it will be told thee what thou must do. And as a believer in Christ, who had repented of his sins, it's obvious by the change in his life, he goes blind into the city, he goes to the place, Christ has appeared to the preacher and Ananias tells him to go to him. And when Ananias gets there, he finds a believer who's repented of his sins. And he says, Now why tarryest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. Calling on the name of the Lord, which is an appeal to the authority of Christ to save him. Conviction opens the heart to instruction. But not everyone is so affected. You watch one of the greatest responses the devil will give a person in sin who's convicted of sin but won't do anything about it. That is, they don't have an honest and good heart to receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save their souls. 
They will immediately begin to point to others. Well, you're just as bad off as I am, or this one over here, to justify themselves. Or they look at the preacher and they say, well, you're a human too. You're trying to get up there and tell me you've never sinned. And so they continue in their sins. Folks, that's the devil talking to you. If you want to listen to him, then prepare for eternity in torment. Not everyone who's convicted will turn from his sins. How many people are up there in Huntsville, in that gated community, convicted, and most of them, or a lot of I can't say most of them, but a lot of them will say, I didn't do it. <laughs> I'm not guilty. In their minds, the evidence is in, and they are guilty, and they knew it in the first place. Well, Felix was struck with fear when Paul preached the gospel to him. But he dismissed Paul, Acts 24 and 25, didn't do a thing to worry about it. The Jews who stoned Stephen, the scripture says they were cut to their heart, Acts 7, 54 through 58. Well, did they, like the Jews on Pentecost, say, men and brethren, what shall we do? No, they were so angry, gnashed on him with their teeth and rushed in upon him and took him out and stoned him to death. Now, once they got him stoned and he was dead, then, of course, they could say, now, what made us mad in the first place? Was it not that he convicted us of our own sins and we still, though he's dead, stand guilty? before God. Go back with me to the book of Proverbs. I want us to notice that conviction is a start, but then one must needs have further instruction. In Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 32, the writer says, He that refuseth instruction despises his own soul. But he that hears reproof getteth understanding. First of all, every preacher who would be a preacher of the word and preach the whole counsel of God needs to know these things regarding his responsibility to God and being faithful as a gospel preacher. But a congregation, especially those who've been converted to Christ, because if they've really been converted, they've been convicted of sin. They have to know how they were brought to conviction of their sin. It was sort of like David and Nathan's preaching to him to cause him to see himself for what he was. And so it is that they recognize that they need instruction. They need understanding from God. They need the truth of God. If you go back to chapter 10 of Proverbs, and you read verse 17, notice what is said about instruction and the person who receives it. He is in the way of life that keeps instruction. But he that refuses reproof erreth. Well, now, if you're going to be in the way of life, you're going to have to be instructed with the gospel of Christ. But it will convict you of your sin and in need of salvation, and you'll see it that way. If you're like David, you'll say, I've sinned. If you're like the people on the day of Pentecost, you'll cry out, having been convicted of your sins, men and brethren, what shall we do? And you'll be obedient to the truth of God concerning forgiveness of sins. But if you're like Felix, you'll tremble. You'll just try to get out of whatever it is that's making you tremble so you can get your mind back up on what's more concerned to you, this present world. We need a, a strong belief in conviction and what convicts us of our sins. It'll shape our lives. It'll cause us to be attentive to the truth. It won't make us try to justify ourselves in our sins and pass it off. Justify ourselves, slip it away, put it under the rug and say, oh, I've done God's will, but the sin's still there. If you look in the New Testament, you'll, you'll see that Abraham's faith is held up as an example of a person who keeps before him the will of the Lord as to what he must do and rejoices in the promises that comes to him because he's faithful to that word. Look at Romans 4, beginning in verse 20. Paul writes, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, writing of Abraham, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able to perform. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. In other words, Abraham, by the will of heaven, revealed to him in God's word, took God at his word, and 
just live that way. God said it. He's going to do it. And I ever keep that before my eyes. Nothing else comes in to separate me from that. And that's the man that went up to his house justified. Paul was convinced of God's love. In Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39, here's what we have. Paul writes, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. How can that be the case? Because he had the same attitude he wrote about about Abraham. God in his word said it. That's the manifestation of God's will. That's the way it is. And I take him at his word. That's faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And it's in the same letter that he wrote that. Romans 10, 17. He took God at his word. It was that conviction that enabled the apostle to endure so much. So much for the cause of Christ. In 2 Corinthians 11, look beginning in verse 22. He's defending his apostleship. He's defending his faithful work for the Lord. And he says of those who were criticizing him and challenging him and trying to put him down and discredit him. He says, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant. In stripes above measure. In prisons more frequent. In deaths oft. Now, I asked the elders, if you were to be looking for a preacher and he gave you this resume, would you give it a second look or say, I don't think we need a fellow like that. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I've been in the deep. In journeyings often. In perils of waters. In perils of robbers. In perils of mine own countrymen. In perils by the heathen. In perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Now elders, don't you want to complain a little bit about this church and all the trouble they give you? Deacons, don't you want to complain a little bit about the service and how people want to do this and be ready for that? Well, I'm not saying we shouldn't be concerned. I'm not saying we shouldn't be concerned in any church we might be working in. But what I'm saying is we've got a long way to go, a long way to go before we can write down what Paul did that we've undergone and suffered for the cause of Christ. Of course, we might not get our Social Security, and that'd be terrible, wouldn't it? It was Peter and John's conviction that allowed them to boldly stand before the Jewish council. Notice, and I hope you ask when you notice this, uh, what's in this for me? What did I learn from this? Why did God put this here? When I read it, what do I get out of it? In Acts chapter 4, beginning in verse 19, Luke recorded this. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. For the man was above forty years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed. And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord. Now listen to their attitude. And said, Lord, thou art God, which hath made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, 
with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. In other words, God's still in control as they rebelled against all of it, working it for the good, the gospel scheme of redemption good. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings. And grant unto thy servants, now listen, that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. They've just been told by the government, shut your mouth or we're going to get you. Now what are they going to pray for? Strength to speak on out and do what was right. Brethren, we need that today, and we need it when it comes to understanding the importance of people being convicted of their sins and the responsibility we have as Nathan had to bring that uh, great conviction about by the proper preaching of the Word. Remembering that while it was great, David repented. It's a wonderful thing that people would do that. If it hadn't been for Nathan preaching what needed to be preached, he wouldn't have done it. Now, are you convinced of your sinfulness? Do you understand the reality of awaiting judgment if you don't leave your sinful life according to the terms of the gospel? Have you been fulfilling your duty in convicting the world of their sins or erring church members of their sins? Are you convinced of God's love that He's able to save you from your sins by your humble, from the heart, obedience to the gospel, His power to save you? By being baptized in Christ, having believed in Him, repent of your sins. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, whether you're one that needs to obey the gospel or not, or you're a child of God and need to repent of sins and are done publicly, we ask you to humbly receive this truth. Be convicted of your sins, turn from them in accordance with the terms of the gospel, and be saved by Christ. If you're subject to Him, please come while we stand and sing.